everyone. Um, welcome again to the Visual Cultures Public Program um, that Lorenzo and I are organizing around hostile environments. Um, so for those of you who were here last week, we had a film screening, if you remember, um, where we were sort of, just to sort of give you a little bit of background of where we got to with the um, public program. Um, so last week it was the film screening where we were sort of trying to understand our sort of um, let's say the conceptualization of the hostile environment, which um, in the previous few sessions we talked about, of course, coming from Theresa May's use of the term, but in the plural, hostile environments is a project that Lorenzo is sort of um, working on at the minute, um, which is around understanding um, the, an understanding of how the environment itself, um, the atmosphere, has been um, weaponized for certain kinds of people. And we were last last week. We were sort of trying to understand this through how the environment um, is becoming ruined through settler colonial actions, and it was the, the film was around kind of sinkholes sink near the Dead Sea. Um, but today we're moving to a sort of different perspective. Um, I guess somehow now that we've established um, an understanding of what we mean um, by hostile environments, and this was you know to a kind of more of a legal understanding in the first couple of sessions and then also a kind of environmental and political understanding of it. Now I suppose we're changing the view again um, and thinking about how this environment is encountered by the migrant subject and then also how it then becomes manifest in things like orders and falls. <coughs> so I'm really pleased that we have today with us um, Sharon Khosrabi, who is um, a professor um, of social anthropology at um, Stockholm University. Um, and your work, Sharon, is very much around the questions of migration, human rights, forced displacement, um, and focused in on kind of Iran, particularly as a youth space. Um, your book, Young and Defiant in Tehran, was very much about the youth experience in, uh, in Iran, sorry. And then a book that I think is very pertinent to the questions that we're sort of dealing with in this lecture series, which was called um, The Illegal Traveler and Auto Atomography of. Um, Orders published in 2010. And this book, you know, I guess is somehow an amalgamation of your own experience of kind of um, crossing borders, experiencing borders and that of the illegal travelers that you speak of. And I mean, for me, I mean, it's a really very powerful sort of book, this kind of narrative that begins to speak about the crossing of borders um, without papers and the experience exactly of this kind of hostile environment that we're, um, we've been discussing. Um, and I think one of the really important things about this um, book is really about, it, you know, shows us how people navigate and live through this, how they create uh, relationships and still have a form of agency, find ways of living through really dis difficult circumstances. So it's a book, I think, also with hope in it. Um, and your new project now is called After Deportation, and this is something, you know, I'm really interested in because my work around migration is also trying to think about sort of migration beyond, let's say, a kind of European perspective. So in my case, I'm trying to think of the start of the journey in places like uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, and so, um, but for you, I think it's also kind of thinking about what happens when people return to so the kind of lives that people, when people have to leave the lives that they are living, you know, um, when they go back, what kinds of lives are possible then? Um, and for those of you who are gonna be at the Center for Research Architecture Roundtable tomorrow morning, you're gonna be talking about this new project, ongoing project. Um, so, yeah, that's all I said, I guess, but um, just to say that today you're going to be talking about borders and walls, um, but again, this kind of switching of perspective and your lecture is called What We See When We Look at the Border from the Other Side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you for um, having me here. Thank you, the organizers, for this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> what do we see? If we look at the border from the other side, this was the question I have been thinking about in the past years. So let me start um, with the with social life uh, 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 of a steel plant. During a during a short visit to my village in the Bakhtiari uh, region in southwestern Iran. Two years ago, steel plank used as a balcony railing in my parents' house caught my eye. The railing was made with two so-called Martson mats, known also as pierced steel plank, PSP. 
The house is old, built by my father's grandfather, who lived on what he got from his father. The cold metallic planks between clay walls and old timbers formed a strange symbiosis. The planks were not unfamiliar, um, however, I had seen them before, or rather images of them, long far away from my village, in the images of the border walls between US and Mexico, and the images of Vietnam War. When I asked my father where the planks had come from, he said that a few years earlier he had uh, taken them from an abandoned oil drilling site just 10 kilometers away from the village. Our village is located in Zagros mountain range, extending from southwest Iran to northwest border. The mountain have since ancient times been home for nomadic pastoral commu communities, <coughs> such as Bakhtiaris, whose livelihood depended on green pastures and water resources. So was the life for the Bakhtiaris until the turn of the 20th century, when the British Royal Navy decided to replace coal with oil as its principal fuel. In the first decades of the last century, the British banker William Darcy, backed by the British government, started to drill, to drill in the lands of Bakhtiari nomads. And in 1908, they reached oil, uh, the, the first oil in the Middle East, and they called it well number one. The Anglo-Persian oil company signed contract directly with Bakhtiari tribal leaders, who gained no more than 3%. With more cash capital, the leaders, tribal leaders, were now in more powerful position to oppress the less fortunate members of the tribe. Poor farmers were forced to sell their lands, and the contract between oil company and the leaders obliged nomads and farmers who received nothing from the share to open the lands for oil extraction. Land grabbing began. Poor farmers and pastoralists were turned into low-wage laborers and guards of the pipelines installing their lands. The lure of oil brought many other European and American petroleum companies to the Zagros Mountains, and since then, most more pastoral lands have been turned into wastelands and more people displaced. The dream they drill, move, cut, and deform the soil, rock, rivers, and farm. In the mid-1950s, an Italian company, oil company, Ajib, launched a huge operation in search of oil. Several extraction sites were built on a mountain of 3,000 meters west of our village. Ajib brought pierced steel planks that were used as fences to keep local people out of the residence camps and work sites. They were also used as to build um, a temporary landing pad for helicopters. A few years later, other Italian companies showed up in the region. A new site was set up close to the village. The company started construction of a huge network of long distance underground gas pipeline um, from <coughs> South Iran to, to North. More plants arrived more fences were erected. Three gigantic pipelines carrying natural gas, gas <clears throat> have changed the Bakhtiari land forever. Pipelines opened the remote areas to deforestation, more land grabbing, displacement of nomadic camps, and destruction of natural heritage. The pipelines also destroyed water resources. This region now is um, uh, devastated by the old roads, pipelines, holes, uh, leakages. The long-term consequences of pipelines constructions have been loss of habitat and breeding grounds, and loss of water and food resources. And this is how these plants came to my village. The social history of uh, Pierce steel plants started in the United States during World War II in Martzell, a small town in North Carolina, from which it, um, it got its name, its first name. Constructed for military operation, it was initially named Martzell Man, 
map, then it got a Pierce Steel uh, plant, PSP, uh, as named. The planks were built three meters long and four centimeters wide with nearly 90 holes per plank. Easy to transport and made for rapid construction for runway, the planks soon became a crucial part of American military logistics globally. Effective both in dusty region and muddy um, <clears throat> rainforest, the planks took American Air Force uh, everywhere, from um, faraway islands in the Pacific to uh, Western Europe. Produced in large quantities, the planks were extensively used in many wars, among them World War II and Vietnam War. Um, many images um, many images show them, you see them on the ground, yeah? Many images, uh, 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 so left behind as war surplus, the planks have been reused by civil companies in construction of camps and industrial sites. As traces of the colonial era, they can be found in all corners of the world, from uh, um, Papua New Guinea, to the North uh, Africa. After the war, uh, Second World War, the airfields were abandoned uh, uh, in Italy. Um, American used uh, the planks uh, very much in Italy to build um, um, air airfields. So uh, um, the planks came into to my village. Uh, it is going from Americans to Italy uh, um, as devices for war and then by Italian oil company to, to Iran. Alongside wars and colonial extractions, the planks has also been used in another project to design an imperial border, the border between Mexico and the US. The political scientist Victoria Hatham has observed that planks has were recycled in construction of some older part of um, uh, um, border between Mexico and, and US. You see that planks on the top and on this side. Um, so some uh, part, older part of the, the wall is built of the same planks, yeah? Um, Okay, unlike what they were designed for, the, the planks used as border walls between US and Mexico, uh, or as fences around old uh, drilling sites in Iran, stand vertically and not horizontally on the ground. Standing high to prevent crossing of human bodies, the planks are ideal material for a border wall. The wall serves as opening, ensuring visibility and a more efficient surveillance. An optimal border should be designed to see through, to allow visibility to the other side. Border walls are not only devices to block crossing, but also devices to control and to monitor. As President Trump put it in July 2017, he said, one of the things with the wall is you need transparency. You have to be able to see through it. You have to have opening because you have to see what is on the other side of the wall. So the symbolic meaning of border walls is greater than their physical presence. Border, borders produce new subjectivities. Well, border walls usually have short lived Their impact on people's way of thinking remains for long time. Borders signal that people on the other side are different and desire, dangerous, polluting, and even non-human. Border walls change the social trends and have deep impact on the social imaginary and social relationship, uh, relations even after they fall. Berlin Wall disappeared in 1989. Nevertheless, there are still mental walls dividing people in Germany. In 2005, Two psychologists did uh, a survey study uh, about distance estimation between German cities, um, and 15 it was 15 years after the fall of uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, but still 
people upon the former east and former west, they had very different kinds of uh, uh, understanding of distance. Uh, and it was uh, uh, signifying that a mental wall is still existing in the mind of people. November this year, it's the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, in, in that year, 89, there were only 16 countries having walls. Today, the number is four times more. Almost 70 countries have built or are building walls around the, uh, their territories. Uh, it's huge business. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the walls, fences between Mexico and US, it costs about three million US uh, dollars per kilometer. The Israeli wall costs about one or two million US dollars per kilometer. Saudi Arabia has started a huge wall project uh, with two, 20 billion US dollars. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's about money. Huh? Construction of border walls and fences is a luxury not all the states can afford. They are built by rich states against poor nations. Borders separate two nation states, but also two different ways of experiencing the world, two different forms of life. All borders between states are also borders between classes. Um, as Gloria and Zaldua put it, the bloodiest uh, borders in the world are the ones between rich nations and poor nations. Borders fail to stop the mo mobility by those who are motivated to move. Borders are promises that are created to charm and made to be broken. And they continue to grow taller with every broken promises. It's like uh, Pinocchio's nose, yeah? Same thing. Uh, so every time it fails, it becomes taller. Um, <clears throat> The American legal scholar Mary Fan writes that more border laws are shown to be inefficient. Bordering became more object oriented, resulting in longer, taller, and smart border walls. Borders should be censored, otherwise, they are not borders. <clears throat> borders are hyper visible with sign, color, fences, concrete. They are made to be sensed. Blades of razor wire fences are designed to cut anyone who can attempt to, to cross them. Since the time, uh, since when Pierce steel planks was installed at the border between US and Mexico, <coughs> higher walls have been built. And President Trump has promised to erect even higher walls. Interestingly, new walls are arriving in a period when unauthorized and documented border crossing is lowest on record since 1972. So what else can justify the planned construction of expensive border walls besides excluding the people on the other side of the border from humanity and seeing them as other than human beings? The imperial recycling of pierced steel planks and falls a special and temporal stretching of expulsion. Tracing a genealogy of, of uh, PSP planks from wars to carbon extraction to border walls demonstrate that rather than a na neutral object, the planks have been tools in a project for unsettling of communities and expulsion. As traveling object, the plant's meaning has never changed in relation to, and to the practices and to the environments they have been used to. They, uh, to, to use on scholars' uh, words, they, they are imperial uh, durabilities. They actualize uh, imperial du durabilities. The plants in the balcony in my parents' house, the debris of old but still brutal empire materialized the link between wars and wall, colonial extraction and habitat destruction. So let's me go to the Balkans. Uh, 
During so-called refugee crisis between fall 2015-2016, a German imperial project from the early 20th century was brought back to life to connect Germany to the Middle East. The Berlin-Baghdad railways was built between 1903 and 1940 to connect Berlin to the oil fields in the Middle East. And during so-called refugee crisis, people, tra people, travelers without papers from Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Afghanistan used their same rails um, to guide them as they walked across many borders on food from Turkey and Greece to Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary, Austria, and finally to Germany. And infrastructure of empire was turned into an infrastructure of resistance. They walked on rails to avoid barbed wires. And railways and barbed wire sound like opposite things, but in fact they belong to the same logic of domination. Rails and fences function together in order to commodify mobility. Mobility is valuable when access to it is limited and regulated. Both invented in the 19th century, railways and barbed wire fences have been used in configuration of colonial spaces, colonized spaces. As for railroads, they tie uh, the, the barbed wire, they tied the empire together uh, <clears throat> and, and, and railroads and, and make uh, colonization more penetrating and efficient. Invented by American farmer 1873, barbed wire revolutionized the cattle business, but soon it was used against the American native tribes. European colonists um, fenced open land and turned the nature into property. The consequences were so drastic for nomadic Native Americans, so they named, it, they named barbed wire the devil's rope. The devil's rope. The devil's rope still are used to stop, to regulate, to delay undesirable mobility. Devil's rope is still in an infrastructure of oppression. This one is um, uh, Bakhtiari and Ajib uh, oil site. The other one, this is uh, old image uh, picture from North America and, and uh, American tribe. Uh, and also fences, in, in, in fences. Um, so, Thousands of kilometers of razor barbed wire have been erected along Balkan roads to divert movements of travelers without paper. When the Hungarian authorities kept travelers behind barbed wires on their way uh, toward Germany, they protested, started chanting open borders and freedom, freedom. Sometimes in their own languages, in Fita, in Arabic, and Azadi in Persian. Some slogans have been used, the same slogan have been used in countries they escaped from. By doing this, they link the struggle for infita, Arabic word for openness, or Azadi, Persian word for freedom, in their country of origin, to the openness and freedom in Europe. As beautiful subject, a reference to Sarah Ahmed, um, refugees, chanting freedom and openness, link the oppressive fantasy Europe to the oppressive fences in Kabul, Damascus, Tehran, and Istanbul, and Palestine, of course. If borders uh, produce new subjectivities, subjectivities, border crossing does it too. What was before individual journey now became collective project, walking together, they became a collective movement. A more recent example is migrant caravan from Central America towards US border. The word movement means both the act of moving, changing place, but also an organized activity that challenge existing structure and aim towards social change. Along the rails, through the Balkans, travelers without paper, 
face not only the devil's road, but also another barrier, the temporal barrier. As we know, uh, as we have learned from Ben Anderson, a nation is imagined not only spatially, but also temporally. Temporal imagination is crucial part of uh, the nation, national imagination, synchronization of nation, making people to believe they are in the same time. <clears throat> Bordering practices exclude and include people not only spatially, but also temporally. Borders are not only lines dividing territories and tools for management of spaces, but also for integrating people into or excluding people from national temporalities. One form of temporal exclusion has been the denial of coevalness. That is, the idea that the other belongs to a different temporality. As post-colonial thinkers, Edward Said or Franz Fanon, and also anthropologists Johannes Fabian show, the other, to the Western self, is placed in another time frame than the one European feel they belong to. People categorized as refugees, refugees, asylum seekers, and documented people are seen to belong to a racial time, a non-white time, that legitimize bordering them. Michael Hanchard and Charles Miles, um, two American scholars, have theorized the racialization of time in the context of black Americans' experiences of long-term walling and unsettling since the time of slavery. Racial time is defined as unequal temporal access to resources and power. In order to keep people out and limit their access to resources and power, they are excluded not only spatially but also temporally. This is exactly what Franz Fanon meant when he said you come too late, much too late. In Fanon's understanding, we arrive to the white time, and it, all, it is always too late. We arrive to a pre-existing world of meaning, a world already shaped in which a non-white is not a subject, but only object to a white time that is presented as secular, civilized, modern, progressive, neutral, the racialized other comes always too late and therefore regarded and treated as unequal. The most remarkable reason for deportation I have ever seen is from 1914, when a Russian Jew was deported from Sweden after six years. A short sentence in the police report explaining what, why he was deported reads, he was a bad shoemaker. It was not enough to be a worker. One had to be a good worker. In the same year, two other Russian Jews were deported because one lacked, in quote, a sense of rightness and the other one had sexual diseases. The religious undertones concerning chastity, virtue, and Protestant birth ethic that were used to justify deportation of these three men are obvious. And almost 100 years later, I followed an uh, asylum seeker to a um, um, lawyer. And this asylum seeker explained his situation and said, um, I came a few months ago, and the lawyer asked, okay, what do you say to immigration agency when they ask you why you didn't apply for asylum before <coughs> when you arrived? The asylum seeker said, I say I arrived today. The lawyer said, no, in this country we are Protestants and we don't like lies. He was deported uh, later. So for me, these references to religion bring to my mind Carl Schmitt's idea that all significant concepts of modern theory of states are secularized theological concepts. 
Now, in this bordering practices, I see traces of religion, which I'm trying to conceptualize and understand myself. Just uh, started to think about that. But I think it's very interesting uh, thinking about borders and, and religion. Racialization means one arrives to the world in which bodies are already divided, both spatially and temporally. The world where access to resources and power is allocated according to this logic of belatedness. In my study, in my studies, I have identified four conceptual dimensions of temporalities of border practices, waiting, delaying, circulation, time series. Waiting is <clears throat> Keeping people waiting is a way of experiencing the effect of power. Prolonged waiting produces a feeling of not being in time with others, not being in sync with others. And it can lead to alienation and the sense that other, what people around you do has nothing to do with your life and your experiences. Um, and I'm talking about very long waiting. Um, um, <clears throat> I talking about Afghans who have been waiting 15 years of their 25 years life. Yeah, people who are waiting 10 years, 12 years, eight years. So can you, um, so so we are talking about not only more and more people. Um, are displaced and are in refugee uh, situation, but also they are in this situation longer and longer. 1996, the average time of being in refugee situation was nine years. Today, it's longer than 20 years. So we see that, I mean, in case of Palestinians, we know that they have been waiting for much longer. Another concept uh, and time um, uh, uh, consequences of, of bordering practices is delaying. Like keeping people wait, delaying them is a technique of domination. A central function of Israeli checkpoints is exactly this, constantly delaying Palestinians and thereby racialize their time. Borders do not stop people, but delay them. The journey from Milan to Rome by train takes several hours, but for Hamid, it took two weeks. <clears throat> the distance between Greece Turkey border and Komotini, a small Greek town, is about 100 kilometers and one hour by train. Ahmed walked that distance 16 times, and 15 times he was deported back to Turkey. For Muhammad, Journey from Athens to Berlin took two years. Delaying is part of racialization. In May 2013, I landed in Chicago airport. Uh, it was early morning, 4 a.m. The border control officer was sleepy, but not so sleepy, just let me through. So stopped me. <clears throat> I am Swedish citizen since 30 years ago, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so he gave me, um, only me, not other Swedish passport holder, a form to fill out. And I didn't have a pen. I asked for a pen. He didn't have a pen. He went to find a pen, took time, came back with a pen. I started to fill out the form. The pen stopped working. I start asked for another pen. And he was tired, said, you know, nobody will read this anyway, so go. So what was the point of all this? If not, delaying reminds you your place in the racial hierarchy. The third temporal aspect is um, his circulation. The third aspect of border temporality is keeping people in condition of circulation. A common experience of the condition of deportability and deportation is being sent back in time 
people put it as I was sent back to square one. Or they say I have to start from zero again. The sense of being back to square one shows how people are deprived of the time they have invested to settle down in, in the country they were deported from. Keeping people in circulation is a way to defer and to deny them any future plan and to make a disruption of their time cycle, life cycle. A life in circulation is a position of not becoming in what is supposed to be a normal life course. The condition of circulation, one ne in the condition of circulation, one never gets the chance to finish anything. Finish a training, finish a school, finish a relationship, something, yeah? Uh, control society operates by keeping people continuously on move. People are sent back and forth between undocumentedness and deportability, between countries, between legislation, between institutions, between periods of waiting. A mechanism to keep people always in movement, it is a power mechanism. And this is only one example. Many of uh, people I talk to, Afghans who are deported, and they, they it's very usual uh, case that they, they they come back, um, and um, uh, all, I, I have interviewed 25 uh, Afghans who were deported, have been deported to Afghanistan, and only three of them are in Afghanistan. Uh, the rest are in Europe or in Iran or Turkey. And uh, also other review reports uh, show that up to 75% of all deportees start a new migration within a year after deportation. And this is the case of Hazara uh, Afghans. And Hazara Afghans uh, are stuck between a powerful transnational apparatus which force them, exclude them, expel them from the global north and on the one hand, and on the other hand, the circumstance that forces, which push them towards immigration from the global south. So this is why they are keeping circulation back and forth. Uh, an interesting time um, aspect here is, for them it takes years to come to Europe from Afghanistan, but it takes only six hours to, to be sent back to Afghanistan. So deportation for them is not an end to the migration cycle, but rather it will be only an, another phase of recirculation. They belong to what Peter Nayers calls the deportspora, a combination of diaspora and deportation. The portspora whose members are pushed into transnational corridor of expulsion. Circulation not only in terms of geographical location, but also in terms of various forms of uh, 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 abandonment. So in Afghanistan, Hazara are ethnic religious minority. Uh, they don't have access to full citizenship rights. They are undocumented migrants worker in Iran and Pakistan. They, are, uh, they become irregular migrants from the Balkan for being fake asylum seekers in Europe, and then become deportees in Afghanistan, and again and again, yeah? So as Prem Kumar Rajram writes, this is how a surplus population is constructed. People racialized and marginalized are denied a chance to valorize their labor, to be the port sport is a mode of being in the world characterized by multiple and settling for long waiting, a sense of always arriving too late in Pannonian terms. Nonetheless, the port sporade practices and claims in the forms of remigration, mobilization of transnational network, uh, um, reveals the port spora to be a space of resistance and defiance. With, with, with their mobility, imagination, stances, and claims, travelers without papers make an intervention 
in the construction of global apartheid of mobility. The last part of this temporal is about stealing time, forcing people into waiting, delaying them, and keeping them in circulation is part of an exploitative economic system that results in accumulation of wealth through stealing time. We know that global uh, capital grows through a stealing of workers' time. And this become uh, very uh, explicit in, in the case of, 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 of bordering practices, uh, deportation, keeping people uh, in circulation, waiting and delaying. And we live in an age of mass deportation. Almost three million people have been deported from the United States between 2009 and 2016 and more and more are scheduled to be deported in coming years. Europe is organizing deportation of almost 100,000 uh, to Afghanistan alone. Likewise, deportation is growing outside the global north. Saudi Arabia has deported hundreds of thousands of people every year uh, in recent years. Uh, and since 2016, more than a million Afghans have been deported from uh, Iran and Pakistan. So how much time has been stolen? And what is that time worth to them? When people are um, spatially removed, they automatically are robbed of, of the amount of time. People uh, have worked, built networks, paid taxes, spent time learning the local language, and becoming uh, familiar with the culture, maybe fallen in love, maybe had children before being deported. The time people have invested to achieve this goal is lost by deportation. The time people have spent to accumulate social and cultural uh, and economic capital is taken away <coughs> by deportation, by bordering them. Sudden arrest and deportation means having no chance to prepare for the journey, to sell accumulated, you know, to sell uh, properties, to claim wages, to go to the bank and taking out money, you have only 10 minutes to take your shoes and go. Uh, so many Afghans tell me um, they have been working in Germany, especially in, work in Germany and the uh, condition of doldum, which means tolerance. They can work, uh, they pay taxes, uh, but when deported, they don't have time and chance to go to the bank and take out their money. So they are in Afghanistan or Iran, and they still don't have access to their money. This is stealing. Many, uh, many employers, many em em uh, employers in Iran, for example, they uh, also, uh, when it comes to mass mass deportation, they gain a lot of money thanks to deportation of, of Afghans workers. Yeah. So. Um, Arrest and deportation usually meant an impossibility of reclaiming all this. An illegalized life is unreclaimable since it is not considered to have existed at all. Um, so what about all taxes and social security contribution people may have paid before being removed? Uh, I mean, you have also this Windrush scandal here. So you can see all the stealing of time in many countries. What about unused holidays? How many working hours are stolen? How, many, how much money did their employer save in form of unpaid wages? How much money does the state save in form of unpaid pensions? How much surplus value has been produced for the capitalist through deportation globally? As Marx has shown, surplus value is generated from time the capitalists don't pay for, and the time they steal uh, from laborers. Um, OK, um, let me finished and let me go back to the same village I started this talk. Um, today, um, of the abandoned drilling site where the planks came to my, my parents' home, there is only ring left. 
uh, international sanction invasions and prolonged wars in the region, political oppression, keep unsettling communities. The well, as you see, is our, the wells uh, are kept, only the breed is left, reminding us of vandalized forms of life, failed promises of fossil capitalism, and also a stolen future. Um, the capped wells, interestingly, are used by local people as metaphors in the village when they are talking about lacking future. Uh, lacking future where the, uh, and, and pr where the pr prospect of a better life will not be actualized. So they seek it elsewhere. But between them and elsewhere, with the future, there are many walls. Who can move and stay and under what conditions? And who is placed in waiting rooms and constantly is delayed or sent back to square one? Who enjoy a, a linear trajectory of departure, arriving and settling, and who is kept in condition of circulation and is robbed of her time? What I'm trying to do is um, historicization of, of themes of to, to, to in order to denaturalize, otherwise naturalize, and to politicize, otherwise depoliticize the current order regime. And as many other scholars have shown, I want also to emphasize that bordering practices refer to more than line separating lines and includes even more actors, different practices, organizations, and histories. A, a historicization of uh, borders shows that bordering and border practices, in a sense, are colonial practices. Following other scholars like William Walters and Nicholas Pichard, I believe that contemporary bordering practices are rooted in colonial genealogies of containment and displacement, practices that gave colonial Rome a productive lab, lab, laboratory. Yeah, something. <laughs> For innovations in technologies of policing of population. When we see who is waiting longer in queues outside European embassies around the world, who is waiting longer and are delayed outside migration agencies in the West, and see who is turned into deportable bodies, then we can see uh, also how techniques of migration controls rearticulate colonial practices of racialization and other. So going back to the title of this talk, and to answer the question, I would say that on, on one side, we look at the border and we see frontier, meaning in front, signifying in front of open and free lands, ready for invasion, intervention, and colonization. On the other side, we look at the border and we see walls, meaning partition, rejection. And in that wall, we can see traces of same materialities used in the invasions, wars, interventions, and colonization. Look at the borders from the other side, and what we see is an infrastructure of racism. So I think I stopped. Huh. <laughs>